My name is Kara Dansky and I serve on the board of the Women's Liberation Front. We are an unapologetically radical feminist organization that stands for the rights, privacy, and safety of women and girls. I'm an attorney and I serve on the board of Women's Liberation Front. And in the interest of full disclosure, I want to tell everyone that I previously, between 2012 and 2014, served as senior counsel at the Center for Justice at the ACLU's national office. So I really wanna welcome everyone who is here. We appreciate everyone who has joined. Our panelists are engaged online. You can see all of the panelists. And uh, I want to also thank everyone for your patience and any technical issues that we may have as we adjust to this ongoing world of online engagement. So thank you all for being here. So we are here to discuss women's sports and in particular, Idaho House Bill 500, which was authored by House Representative Barbara Ehart, who is here with us tonight, and we're very much looking forward to hearing from her. And also the threat that gender identity presents to female spaces, especially posed by the lawsuit that was recently filed by the ACLU to challenge the law that Barbara wrote. I want to say at the outset that we are a very politically diverse panel. We have lots of political ideologies represented on this panel and the panelists are open to discussing that and talking about their own political orientation. And I want to say something about language, which is to say that when we talk about sex and gender, sometimes it can become a little bit confusing in terms of how we're using words like sex and gender and also other words and we'll be exploring that a lot later on during this evening's discussion but i just want to invite attendees of tonight's webinar to really think about how our panelists are using language when they talk about women's sports in general and about idaho hb 500 in particular and finally i want to say specifically on the topic of language, that an example of that is a case that's happening in the state of Connecticut. I'm deviating from the Ohio, from the Idaho story for a moment, just to talk about Connecticut, where a group of girls has sued their state athletic association and complained that allowing boys to compete against girls is unlawful. And recently in that case, the federal judge who is presiding over it ordered the girl's attorney to refer to male athletes as transgender females. And the attorney filed a motion to disqualify that judge in that case, and that motion is pending. So that's just an example about how we can be thinking about how we're all using language when we discuss sex and gender, specifically in sports, but in a variety of contexts that goes far beyond sports. And I will also just say in the Connecticut case, there was some very good news that came out today, which is that the United States Department of Education has in fact issued a ruling that allowing boys to compete in girls sports violates Title IX. And that's, that's brand new news to many of us who have been working in this space for a while. And I would invite the panelists to address that recent administrative ruling in their remarks if they feel that that's appropriate or if they want to do that. So thank you everyone for being here. And our first speaker is Representative Ehart from the state of Idaho. Representative Ehart, if you would like to unmute yourself at this time, that would be great. So Representative Ehart, welcome and thank you so much for being here. And I'd like to ask you a question at the outset, which is, why did you bring HB 500? What does it mean to you? What does it do? Just give us some context for what we're talking about here tonight. Absolutely. And if I may, Kara, uh, to you and Olive Wolf and, and uh, also, uh, these are strong women who are joining uh, this panel discussion and I, I, I'm blessed to be a part of it. Uh, let me just say in response to your first question in your introduction, uh, something about Title IX, because Title IX really had um, probably as much, if not everything, to do with this particular legislation. Title IX changed my life. I think it's important to state that. And so for me, um, 
bringing this legislation forward was key. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of my background. I, I was born in the 60s, basically grew up in the 70s. And I was, so many people won't quite understand this if they're younger than um, uh, Keely and myself, but when, when we were growing up, my options as to that which I could do were very limited. I could be a mom, and I, I never ended up being a mom. I thought I would, I would love to have been a mom, but that didn't happen. I could be a secretary. I did not want to be a secretary. I could be, for whatever reason, I thought I could be an airline stewardess. I did not want to do that. I could teach school, something I pursued. But what I told everyone when they asked me, what is it that you want to be and do when you grow up? I told them I wanted to play sports. And you know what I was told? I was told that's not what girls do. And so in 1972, as a little kid, when Title IX was passed, I did not understand at that moment it would change my life. And because of Title IX, I was able to go on and play junior high basketball, which hadn't been a common thing, uh, especially in Idaho. I played high school basketball, and then I had an opportunity to play collegiately, ending up uh, playing on a scholarship at Idaho State. And it was from there that I was able to follow my head coach, and I spent 15 years coaching Division I women's basketball at four fantastic institutions. And it was with this background, understanding the stark differences between men and women that as I started and have been able to observe the last four, five, six years, what's been happening throughout, not just the United States, but also internationally, where we have seen more and more biological uh, males start to compete and take away spots of opportunities for females that I was very much troubled by this because I know what it was like to grow up when I didn't have those opportunities. I had to fight for every opportunity I received and boys and men had it, uh, had those opportunities come to them so much more easily. And so again, in bringing forward this legislation, it was the idea that we need to preserve opportunities for girls and women in sports. And that's essentially what this legislation was about based on my experiences, both as an athlete, as a division one women's basketball coach, and as someone who values um, what it means to compete and to compete on a fair playing field. That's why it was important to me. Thank you so much, Representative Ehart. And can you tell us a little bit about your experiences ushering the legislation through the state legislature and ultimately to the governor's desk where it was ultimately signed? Absolutely. Um, you know, it was a unique experience. Uh, most people don't always understand how legislation comes forward. In Idaho, you have to have a print hearing just to get it introduced, and it came forward in House State Affairs. That means that as I brought it forward, it was given a hearing, and it is during the hearing you're presenting to a committee. That's where people can come and testify. And we, there were so many people um, who turned out to testify against it that uh, we went through two days of hearings. It was also unique, if, if I may say at this point, uh, that it was during these hearings that unfortunately you could feel animosity, uh, that this seemed to be more politicized and, and driven by means other than that for which the bill stood. This bill was about opportunities for girls and women and it, it uh, was trying to be turned into something that it wasn't. And I, I think we'll address that later, but we got it through on, um, unfortunately as a party line vote, vote. I only say unfortunately because when I first, at the beginning of the session, I actually had a couple conversations with some of my Democrat colleagues and who had both participated in sports, who were a little bit, uh, one of whom was a little bit older. And I'm telling you on the onset, they were in favor of this. But again, when sometimes when bills get politicized, when it's brought as legislation, then everybody begins to take sides because I know for a fact through polling and uh, nationwide conversations, this kind of legislation is strongly supported on both sides of the aisle because it's fair, because it makes sense, because we want opportunities to continue for our girls and women. Anyway, sorry, I deviated, but, but then it, we, it, uh, after it passed in committee, it went to the House floor um, and you know passed uh, with a 54-16 uh, vote. And so then it started over on the Senate side. And on the Senate side, it was almost the exact same people who testified uh, in the House testified in the Senate. Um, and uh, uh, I know that uh, Inga had joined us for uh, one of the days, and it was it's always quite an interesting experience. It was during these hearings, though, that 
as tensions get high, um, you know, my personal experiences uh, were kind of interesting because I ended up having to have police escort uh, on both of the days of the hearing, on other days also, uh, with, with some of the chatter, some of the talk that Idaho State Police had heard. And that gets a little disconcerting that you would have to worry about your safety as you're bringing forward something that is actually codifying what's always been. Because Title IX, 50, almost 50 years ago, gave us or rather solidify these opportunities that we should have had. And so anyway, after it had passed the Senate, and actually let me say during the Senate that uh, Senator Mary Sousa has also been a co-sponsor uh, with the, this bill. You have to have both the representative and the senator uh, it's, it, because once it passed the Senate, then it went to the Senate floor. And at that point, the only people that can speak to it are senators. And so uh, Senator Sousa carried the bill at that point. And then uh, there, we made a couple of amendments that came back to the House floor where we gained even more support for it, uh, two more uh, votes, and it went to the governor's office. At that time, we had kind of signed he died uh, because of the virus, and we had to wait uh, 12 days to see what the governor would do. But that was kind of the process, uh, how this bill had come about, and during the whole time, there was national attention, and, and um, you know, the powers that be were doing all they could to stop the progress of this bill. Luckily. Um, uh, fair-mindedness prevailed. Thank you. Um, so as I said in the beginning, we are going to handle questions and answers afterwards, but there's a question in the Q&A that I think might be appropriate to address now, which is, can you clarify exactly what your legislation does? Oh yes, absolutely. So this legislation, it really isn't that long. The um, It's four pages, actually not even four pages. And when we get to the heart of the matter on section three, it clarifies that in athletics, there are inherent differences between males and females, girls, boys, men, women, and that these inherent differences are to be celebrated. And with these differences, um, uh, we were clarifying that there, we would determine one sex, one of three ways, and it would be either the physiological uh, makeup, uh, you know, just who we were at born at birth or the chromosomal XX, XY, that doesn't change. Every cell in our body is stamped with one or the other and or uh, our, hormonal, our hormonal makeup uh, as it stands uh, naturally. And so uh, the bill then states that uh, if necessary, uh, that it, we would use this process to determine uh, one sex and again, the word sex was used because this bill is not about, it doesn't mind if you, however you identify, you can still identify however you want, feel however you want, but the bill is about sex. And then uh, it clarifies that boys then will play on boys teams, girls on girls, and um, gives a process then by which if there's a question, uh, you know, the, it, this is determined by one's healthcare provider. And if there's a question, uh, our uh, Idaho State Board of Education will promulgate uh, necessary rules to make uh, this happen. But let me just state that as with all Idaho, well, with Idaho High School Activities Association, with any state activities association, there are already rules in place used to address questions of eligibility, because questions of eligibility pop up all the time, whether it's one's age, GPA, uh, boundaries, if you're in wrestling, one's weight class. And so our athletic directors already have a process in place to determine questions that may arise. And as with any other sport, no one in the middle of a game can just pop up, stop the game, and uh, make an accusation that would remove a player from the playing field. That doesn't happen in football, it doesn't happen in wrestling, it certainly wouldn't happen on uh, the girls' side. But if there are questions, they would take it to an athletic director and would be handled then and there. So in essence, that's the bill. Thank you so much. And we'll have to move on. There'll be plenty of time for Q&A later, but I do want to ask you one final question, which is that, did you have any experiences during the process of getting this bill through the legislature that you'd like to share with our audience tonight? You know, um, this bill, as much as anything that I've done in my short time serving as a legislature, in the legislature was very personal to me, obviously, because of my background. And so 
uh, you know, it was it, throughout this process, as one can imagine with today's social media, with those who are at the Capitol, um, if people have wondered, yes, you know, um, there were comments, statements. Um, I was called off the house floor at one point by the Idaho State Police as they informed me of information that they received that uh, for me to be aware in case, um, you know, uh, certain groups were going to try certain things. And so those are the kind of things that become disconcerting when you have to be escorted by three police out of a hearing, uh, when people are jumping at you and, and um, you know, yelling and insinuating things all because of a lack of understanding that the very thing that they claim is happening is what's happening to girls and women, that we are trying to protect ourselves from being discriminated against by those who uh, would have and give more opportunities to boys and men. See, this bill does not take away any opportunity for any male to compete. They can identify how they want, they can identify as a female, it's just that they will be able to compete, but it'll have to be on in the uh, team sport of their biological sex. So yes, Kara, I, would, um, I, I did have some experiences that were a little disconcerting, but uh, you know, I, I was grateful to our Idaho State Police and all those who were there to help and ensure that things continued as peacefully as possible. Okay, thank you so much, Barbara Ehart. And again, thank you so much for being with us uh, for tonight's webinar. Our next panelist is Inga Thompson. Inga is an Olympic cyclist who founded her own foundation. And she's going to talk a little bit about the experience of competing in the Olympics as a female cyclist competing against other women. Thanks, Inga, for being with us tonight. Uh, thanks for having me here. Yeah, my start was was like Barbara's. You know, Title IX had just been enacted. And as a little girl, all I ever want to do is compete in sports. And it was like, no, there aren't sports for girls. And Title IX came through and and then we could go to like, you know, junior high school and high school, and we had sports that were for, for us. And I was that gangly, super shy young girl that came from a broken family. And sports was my savior, being able to, to participate. Yes, I was always the last one chosen on the team, which is significant because had boys been able to compete like they can now, I would have been that young girl that never got a spot and was never able to develop myself. But, you know, through time and through gaining confidence, I kept barely making the team. And you get introduced to these coaches that will develop you and they will bring you along. And, and I'm not the only girl that this happened. I, I felt like this cross country team that we had, we were just a bunch of broken young girls and that we came together and we went on and, and through this support, we went on to win multiple uh, national titles, you know, we are, uh, and also state titles. I think we had nine state titles, this little broken group of girls. And had we thrown young boys in there, none of us would have had that opportunity. And Title IX was started to protect young girls. And that's what we need to remember here is to protect the young girls. And then through this process, I was able to get a, scho a college scholarship, not a great scholarship, but it gave me that start. And I got injured and then eventually found bicycling and I found my niche. But in the process of finding that niche, three Olympics later, I attribute that to all of those coaches that I had through junior high school and through high school and through college that I never ever would have had. And so, and in their development of just not me, but all of these women, you know, when I think about the 10 world championships I've been on and all the medals, it was through these, and just not me, all of the, the women on my team was through Title IX and through the coaches to develop us, the young women. And I understand that these boys have gender dysphoria issues and I feel for them, but, but a, a boy's gender dysphoria doesn't have a place in women's sports. Title IX is about protecting the women. 
and we don't need to get lost in this because the way that this is growing in just since 2015, when they changed it to you can just identify, women's records are falling left and right. And these are records that these women have been developing for 20 and 30 years, just fall away with a few efforts by a biological male. And we are going to get lost in this process. When I, you know, you hear these arguments that they need to be with the women because they're so few. Thankfully, being transgender is much more acceptable now and we're welcoming them with open arms. We can't forget the young girls. And when, when I was first starting in cycling, I was the only woman on the line. And we took time, we developed our sport. And you look at women's cycling now, and it's the international, we have the Olympics now, we had the Women's Tour de France, we have, you know, the, the UCI World Tour, but we developed this sport, the women did. And, and one of my platforms that I was on is I, want, I, I asked the, United, or the International Olympic Committee that you're selling short all the transgender athletes and that you need to start a category for them. We want them to be included in sports, just not in the women. And that it's time to develop you know, a platform for the transgender athletes elsewhere and to protect the women. And so th this is why I'm here is because when I started my foundation, I really wanted to promote women. And I, I never thought that this would be what I'd be fighting for is just to have the right to be a woman in a field and not have it taken over by the biological males, because this is where it's going. So. Thank you so much, Inga. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in in the Q&A, so that's great. So I want to make sure we have plenty of time to address them. Our next speaker is going to be Keely Emerine Mix. Uh, we're very happy to be able to say that Keely is a member of the Women's Liberation Front and she lives in Idaho. And Keely is going to bring us a radical feminist critique of gender and talk a little bit about why allowing biological males into sports designed for women and girls and protected by Title IX of the Civil Rights Act of 1972 might be an important issue to talk about. Keely, thanks so much for being here. I'm really glad to be here and I'm so proud to be a member of this panel. I admire all of you so much and I'm grateful to be included. When I moved to Idaho 18 years ago, I didn't expect to be terribly involved in too many things. I'm a radical feminist, but Idaho is a conservative state. I wasn't sure what a lifelong Democrat would ever have in common with some of the more conservative political people in Idaho. And yet that's what I am. I am a radical feminist. I am a lifelong Democrat. And I am grateful to my conservative Republican sister and friend, Barbara E. Hart and Mary Sousa for this bill. And I'm grateful to our Republican governor, Brad Little, for signing it. Most everybody who knows me won't be surprised that I take an opportunity to offer a bit of a tutorial on pretty much anything I ever do. And I think it's important that we understand first and foremost here that words have meaning. So I wanna go over some of the words that we're gonna be using. Radical, for example, if I say that I'm a radical feminist, that doesn't mean that I am more fervent or more militant in my feminism than some liberal feminists. It's a difference not in degree, but a difference in kind. Radical feminists deal with, we try to get to the root of, that comes from the word radical, social problems. And we believe that the social problems of the class of men who oppress that class of people known as women is at the root or at the, the forefront of this issue. What's disturbing is that when I moved to Idaho 18 years ago, I never thought that I would be involved in a political matter that has to do with simple meanings of common words, simple objective truths that are falling away at a rapid and dangerous rate in favor of subjective fancies, subjective opinion, subjective experience. Radical feminists are interested not in individual decision and in individual views on things. We're interested in the objective truths. For example, something I never thought I would have to argue is that there really is a category of male human beings called men or boys. There really is a category of female human beings and they're called women 
and girls. Those are objective qualities. They don't change. They don't change because somebody chooses to identify as the sex that they are not. And what we're doing as a society and what we as radical feminists object to is the wholesale selling out of objective terms of meaning in favor of these subjective fancies. Now, we're not opposed to how people choose to describe themselves. You could describe yourself as the best baker in Fort Myers, Florida, if you want to, and nobody cares. There's absolutely no concern there. Your making that declaration is impossible to prove or disprove, and it really doesn't matter. Have at it. But when you are a male human being, when you are born male, you will die male. Sex cannot be changed. Sex is immutable. And when you identify because you feel like you're a woman or you feel like you were born in the wrong body or you feel that you just aren't quite at home the way you are and you choose to then identify into an objectively false category for you, that's something that we have to object to because when men are allowed to do that, when men are allowed to compete or boys are allowed to compete, on sports teams that were designed for and made available for girls and women, they can identify as girls if they want to. They can identify as women if they want to. What they can't identify out of, they cannot identify out of the inherent strength and size and speed that they possess as men. That makes it inherently unfair for men to claim that they belong to the other sex and then be allowed to compete. Identity doesn't work in changing fundamental ontological aspects of our character, of our makeup. I am short. I am going to be short the rest of my life. I am Welsh and Polish. I'm going to be Welsh and Polish the rest of my life. None of that matters. My deciding that I'm interested in other things doesn't matter. How I even identify in those aspects of my life doesn't matter. But it matters greatly to the fight for women's rights that we continue to honor objective biological sex over the, identity, the idea of gender identity. What is gender? Gender is simply a set of sex stereotypes that people have decided to believe it's a communal thought process that uses these sex stereotypes, the ones that we thought that we had all opted out of when we became enlightened at the age of reason, the ones that we all thought made us feminists. Those sex stereotypes exist. They have features. That means uh, those sex stereotypes are the things that say that if a little boy plays with Barbie and likes My Little Pony and wears tutus, well, he must be trans and he must actually be a woman. No, he's actually a little boy who likes those things. He is working against the gender stereotypes of his sex. A little girl, I suspect like Barbara and Inga and me who liked trucks and frogs and baseball. We weren't really men or boys. We were little girls who, for one reason or another, didn't like the things that were coherent in this socially constructed thing called gender with our own sex. Radical feminists believe that gender is an enemy. Gender is an enemy because it has the function of ensuring continued male supremacy and continued male dominance over women. When you discuss whether someone is appropriately feminine or appropriately masculine, and that hierarchy never changes, it's always going to be masculine on top, feminine on the bottom. That's what gender is. Biological sex is you're born with the presence of female primary sex organs. Your chromosomal makeup is XX. Like Barbara said, that's encoded into every cell of your body. If you're male, you're born with visible primary sex characteristics, your chromosomal makeup is XY. And again, that is coded into every cell of your body. That sex and biological sex, not gender, is the basis of our oppression under that class of people called men. It's not gender. Gender has form and it has function, but the only form that it really has is people deciding to believe in it. 
And I and my sisters and Wolf have decided not to believe in gender. We reject gender. We believe gender is the enemy. What would that look like? It would look like me. It would look like most of us. We don't care if we present feminine or not. We don't care that we might look masculine or not. In my life, I try to go by a code that suggests only that I practice love and joy and peace and patience. Those are available characteristics to all sexes, but gender identity presumes that the subjective can trump the biologically objective nature of biological sex, and it cannot be tolerated in women's sports and in many other places in society. Keely, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for sharing that analysis. Our final panelist is Jennifer Chavez. I'm very proud to say that I serve on the board of the Women's Liberation Front with Jennifer. Jennifer is an attorney with decades of experience and she's going to help us break down what is actually contained in the ACLU's complaint against HB 500 and why we should be concerned about it. Jennifer, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for adding some years to my experience also. I'm <laughs> I have about 16 years experience as a lawyer. Um, so, okay, I want to talk about the lawsuit and normally I would probably start out by talking about the plaintiffs, but I think we all know that it's not children and teenagers who are driving this push to um, recognize gender identity under the law. It's adults in places of power. And some of the most powerful institutions in the country have gotten together and descended on Idaho because of this law. So I want to briefly touch on that. Um, the first set of lawyers who filed this lawsuit come from the ACLU and ACLU Idaho. For anyone who's watching that is from outside of the US or just not familiar, this is a very powerful organization. They are a nonprofit, um, but at the end of last year, they had $150 million in net assets. Their executive director takes home a half a million every year. Uh, since 2005, they've filed 38 lawsuits just on the issue of gender identity or intervened in lawsuits. And I was able to count just over the last two years or over 2019 and 2020, that they have at least 16 ACLU national lawyers working on this issue. If you were to count all of the regional affiliates, that number would double or triple. Um, the, second, the second lawyer who's on the case, who filed this case, um, comes from an, a regional organization called Legal Voice, and their tagline is, women's rights, nothing less. So they still have the nerve to use women in their top line branding, but they're actually, they've reformed themselves into a group that represents men against the, the interests of women. The third set of lawyers comes from a large commercial for-profit uh, law firm called Cooley LLP. This is one of the top firms in the United States by wealth, and they were num named number one in uh, venture capital law and technology law. They can afford to pay three of their lawyers uh, to work on this case on the firm's own dime, and that enables them to claim progressive street cred. Um, notably, one of the three Cooley lawyers working on the lawsuit was a clerk for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and um, it's just it's notable because in 1975, Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote an op-ed assuring the American public that the adoption of an equal rights amendment would not erase women as a sex class under the law. And she talked about the right to have sex specific showers and locker rooms and things like that as a right of constitutional dimension. Uh, but how times have changed. Um, Next, I want to touch very briefly on the plaintiffs in the case. There are two plaintiffs. The first is Lindsay Hecox. Um, the first two factual allegations in the complaint say, one, Lindsay Hecox is a 19-year-old woman currently attending Boise State University. 
two, a recent photo of Lindsay. And then there's a, an actual large photograph of Lindsay embedded in the complaint, uh, you know, sort of as if to say, see, long hair, curly, wears a necklace and heavy makeup. It's, it's got to be a woman. Um, the complaint says that Lindsay started taking estrogen as well as testosterone sup, uh, suppression. I should say, of course, that the, the, the complaint doesn't try to hide that Lindsay is male, in fact. Um, and started taking this, uh, started uh, his transition, so to speak, while he was attending Boise State. So we can safely assume that Lindsay enjoys the benefits of a full male puberty and all the athletic advantages that that produces. The second plaintiff is a teenage girl. This is not her real name, but she's designated in the complaint as Jane Doe. She's an athlete um, in an Idaho high school who does not identify as transgender. Um, she says she wants to play soccer in the fall in, in her senior year of high school, which she has done every year. But she says she's concerned because she thinks that one of her competitors might decide to dispute her sex just to try to keep her from playing. And she uh, argues that this law has created a system where other people can bully her. Um, uh, of course, they could have done that before without the law, um, but, but that's the allegation. I won't talk about the court um, or the defendants. I mean, the defendants are a, a whole host of, of people uh, employed by the state. The court is the District Court of Idaho, and it's within the Ninth Circuit in the U.S. If we have time, I'll come back and talk about that. But I want to talk about the specific claims that they're making. Before I, before I go into that, though, I want to just set the table and say that every single one of these claims in the lawsuit is founded on the fiction that a man who identifies as a woman or who identifies as transgender is a type of woman. Uh, and also that transgender status is a type of category that's not even comparable or equivalent to sex, but a, that is more important than sex. Um, and for example, according to the complaint, the law targets women deemed insufficiently female or insufficiently feminine. Um, but of course, the law says nothing about femininity and it just addresses sex, males and females. Uh, so you have, and in reading the complaint, you really kind of have to translate it to yourself in your mind. Uh, okay, so getting down to the specific um, claims that they're making here. The first is a violation of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. Um, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment basically just says that the states shall not deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And um, the plaintiffs argue that classifications based on both on sex and gender identity must be given heightened scrutiny. So, of course, we already know that the Act doesn't create a class uh, of transgender people. It, it just deals with sex. But that's the first sort of flaw of their argument. Um, the Supreme Court has developed cases over many years that uh, under, whereby you get different levels of scrutiny for different types of laws. So your garden variety law just gets what's called rational basis scrutiny and the government just has to show that they have a rational reason for doing what they've done. On the other end of this extreme, you have uh, strict scrutiny and that applies to constitutionally protected liberties like procreation, marriage, speech. Um, and it also applies when a law discriminates against a protected class of people. For example, classifications based on race or national origin. And this is what the plaintiffs are arguing that this law should get. Um, laws that deal with sex and uh, single out women or treat women differently typically have been given intermediate scrutiny, which is somewhere in between. Um, and unfortunately, a few district courts, a few federal district courts have ruled that transgender status is a cognizable status and they've given it heightened and even strict scrutiny. Um, but the Supreme Court has not yet ruled on this question. 
to my mind, the biggest flaw of this argument is that they're attempting to obtain recognition under the Constitution for a category that is not fixed by any objective criteria, can be picked up or dropped at any time for any reason that any person wants, um, and can change over time, can be fluid. So it, it would be, it is like creating a protected class of people who self-identify as introverts or empaths or goths. Um, and this is really what the case all comes down to. It demands that everyone adopt a belief in gender identity because only by adopting that fiction can you avoid the uncontested fact that the lead plaintiff is a male demanding the right to participate in women's sports. And of course, in order to get to that point, you have to blind yourself to the legitimate interest that the government has in protecting a fair playing field for women and girls in sports. If you read the complaint, only Lindsay's inability to play on the team he prefers matters. Uh, the fact that he would be taking the spot on the team from a woman who survived girlhood, who experienced female puberty, who probably has a menstrual cycle that affects her performance. We're supposed to just ignore her legal interests, much less her feelings and how that would affect her self-esteem, her future prospects for, for scholarships and access to education could all be, uh, you know, just wrecked by that one, uh, that one loss of, the, of a slot on a team. But that woman is invisible in this complaint. Um, so Jennifer, I think we're going to have to wrap up because we only have 15 more minutes. Is that okay? Okay. Sure. Um, we have a lot of questions from the audience, which I'm excited to hear the panelists' responses to. Uh, there are two that I think I can address very quickly, and then I'm going to be quiet and, and field questions for the panelists themselves. I might have a few questions for the panelists as well. One question that came in in the Q&A is, can males who take hormones uh, achieve the, the same level of hormonal levels as female athletes? And the answer to that question is probably no, but even if they could, males still have physiological advantages over female athletes that have nothing to do with hormones, including bone structure, lung capacity, muscle strength. So at the end of the day, male athletes will always have physiological advantages over female athletes. But also, even if that were not true, which it is, the Women's Liberation Front will always maintain that women have the right to say no to men in our spaces, men and boys in our spaces, unconditionally under any circumstances. Another question that came in are, what are the arguments against the law? And that's a, that's a really good question. Maybe Representative Ehart would like to address that, but I, I think I can probably speculate based on what I've read of the Idaho law that Representative Ehart got through the legislature. The argument against it is that there are men who are quote unquote, born in the wrong body or boys who are born in the wrong body who are actually or who identify as female. That's, that's the crux of the argument against Representative Ehart's law and against what Jennifer is making the case for in terms of Wolf's legal position, which is that that simply can never be true. So I hope that answers those two questions. Um, a lot of questions came in. I'm just gonna fire them at the panelists and we only have a little over 10 minutes. Representative Ehart, are there sex-based differences such as hurdle heights in Idaho? So the question posed was basically in the Olympics, uh, there are differences in hurdle heights for track competitions between male and female track. Does that exist in Idaho sports, if you know? Uh, certainly in track, uh, there would be. Uh, in basketball, we still shoot at the uh, same rim, same size. Uh, we don't have volleyball, but collegially, if you have volleyball, you know, the nets would be different. So, uh, but certainly in track. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I, this question just came in generically, but I think it's probably best addressed to Keely. Uh, this, this questioner uh, says that she is a lesbian radical feminist from Idaho, and her question is, how do we persuade women that Representative Ehart's bill is truly in our interests? And she means she's referring there to liberal women who may think that, that Representative Ehart's bill is not in our interests. That's a great question, and it's one that I answer a lot. We have to remember, again, that the reason that we suffer oppression from that class of people known as men is because of our sex, not because of how we identify, not because of how we feel about it, but because of our biological sex. And again, that never changes. What we have to do is get women, and I think especially lesbian women, to understand that the destruction of lesbian history, lesbian culture, lesbian spaces, women's history, culture, and spaces is proceeding at a rapid rate because liberals who deign tolerance to be the most important virtue of all, even over objective truth, have argued for the rights of biological men who say that they're born in the wrong body, who say that they're women, to enter those spaces. If we show that it's happening now and it's happening because of the failures of liberalism in defending women's spaces and women's sex-based oppression, I think we have a fighting chance to win it over some people. And I would urge you, please feel free to get in contact with me after the seminar if you'd like. Thanks, Keely. And you mentioned this earlier, but again, just to reiterate, if I'm not wrong, you are a lifelong Democrat and you bring this radical feminist critique of gender. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely, okay. right. absolutely. And I used to call myself a liberal, but no. Um, so to Inga, there's a question about sports that I have no idea how to answer. I don't know if you know how to answer. If you do, please do. At what age does girls sports become women's sports? And is that the same age as boys sports become men's sports. I just have always assumed that age is 18, but do you have any insight to share on that? Um, you know, I think it starts at a really young age. Well, I'm gonna say like junior high school is when you already start seeing that segregation, but I don't wanna confuse into that intercollegiate or just, you know, where boys and girls are playing together, having, you know, fun intramural type sports. But when you actually get into competition. I noticed it when I was in fifth grade in track and field that the young boys about my same age couldn't touch them. You know, they're just, they have the XY chromosome and with that, all of the advantages that it allows. I loved training with the men and the boys because it made me push more, longer, stronger, harder to become a better female athlete, but it starts at a pretty young age. You know, when you look at how boys and girls, how we grow from, say, when we're born, girls do mature more quickly. And we start menstruating, you know, everything we do more quickly than the boy. Once you, until you hit that point that you start menstruating anywhere between, what is that, 10 to 13 years old is kind of like the average. And then that's where you really see the girls kind of drop off. And then the boys starting to get, as they start entering puberty. Um, but I think it starts at a very young age because some of these girls are so timid that they need that support to get, to get the bravery. I mean, our generation was one of, we were not supposed to be there in the first place. We are already bucking the field just being there, but I still think a lot of this holds true and there's more empowerment. You know, we see the soccer and we see women up there and the, the encouragement of the young girls has to start at a very, very young age, like it is with boys. We need that too. We have not even begun to have tapped the, the potential for really good female athletes out there. And we're just now starting to see that because we have the support at this very young age. And I hate to see that suppressed because hey, of gender dysphoria. Kara, just technically with the bill, may I say this, uh, is if it's also a technical question, when it re when in the bill, when it references boys, we are talking those who are in high school, boys and girls, those who are in high school, men and women would be referencing those who are uh, in college, as far as the bill's technical concern is. Okay, thank you both so much for that. 
I just want to say that we have a lot of questions pouring in. We will not be able to get to every question. I'm going to continue to do my best to get to all the questions within the hour. Jennifer, a uh, two-part question for you, and these are not particularly related, so I hope it's okay. One question that came in through the Q&A is, can you address how the discussion of the phrase intersex affects all of this under the law. And the second part is if you have any thoughts on whether laws that enshrine gender identity into the law disproportionately affect certain segments of women and girls. Sure. Okay. So yes, very quickly, um, the intersex argument um, for anyone who's not familiar, basically, there are people who have what's, what's sometimes called disorders of sex development um, and also called intersex. The term intersex is invoked 49 times in the complaint, even though the law doesn't say anything about intersex conditions and there's no intersex plaintiff. So it's pretty, pretty apparent to me that they're trying to use this to sort of borrow a sense of scientific legitimacy for their argument. Lindsay Hecox is not, does not claim to be intersex, nor does the other plaintiff in the case. Um, but it does address that and it raises the specter of uh, the possibility that there are all these people out there who are intersex and it would be unfair to exclude them. But the fact is that Point, only 0.018% of the population have those types of conditions that make it truly difficult to determine sex. Virtually all um, intersex conditions are male specific or female specific. So they almost are the exceptions that prove the rule. Um, and of course, a, a person who has an intersex condition would still be able to compete in the sex that they are. Um, as to the second question, thanks for asking. That's a really important um, point. Uh, the, the fact is that we still are not equal in, in terms of opportunity. Um, across the board in the United States, um, there are fewer team slots available per capita or per, you know, per 100 girls in a school than there are for boys. And the disparities are really stark when you look um, on the basis of race. So if you have a heavily white school, <clears throat> the boys in that school may have, on average have 62 slots available per 100 boys that attend the school. If you look at a heavily, heavily black school, the girls only have about 20 slots available per 100. So even just the loss of one of those slots would have a disproportionate effect on the girls in that school. Thank you so much. Okay, we only have a few more minutes. I'm shutting down Q&A. I think we got to almost all of the audience questions on Q&A. And just with the last few minutes, uh, I, I wanna just very briefly address the issue of cross-partisan organizing on behalf of women's sex-based rights. As I mentioned in the introduction, this panel is a very politically diverse panel. And Jennifer, do you wanna say something very briefly about a factual complaint that's being made or a factual allegation rather that's being presented in the ACLU's complaint about the Alliance Defending Freedom? Um, yeah, it, it's confusing uh, because uh, they, they, they basically, are arguing that the Alliance Defending Freedom is behind this bill and that they're behind a whole host of bills across the country. And they're making it sound very conspiratorial. In fact, they even make the fact that the bill was signed after the, uh, you know, after the coronavirus really kind of came into everyone's consciousness. They're making a big deal of that. Um, but it's perfectly, ordinary and, and you know, it's what groups do um, to try to get involved in the development of legislation. That's, that's ordinary, that's civic engagement. That's what people are supposed to do. That's what groups like the ACLU do all of the time and every other 
major nonprofit that you've ever heard of works with legislators to try to get a bill passed that they like and, and including helping to write it. That's just normal behavior. So um, I think that, you know, as you heard from Representative Ehart, there were a lot of voices and input that went into the, into the case. I think what they're trying to do is just appeal to the emotions or to, um, you know, political bias. Thank you. And in fact, when I worked at the ACLU, I sat in many rooms at the national offices, both in New York and in Washington, D.C., with some very senior employees of the ACLU who were very proud of their work joining with conservatives on a whole host of issues. So it's a little bit surprising to see the ACLU now shaming the state of Idaho for doing cross-partisan organizing to protect women and girls. Karen, Karen, can I say something really quick, just to make, put it on the record? Please. I, I started this process on my own, right out here outside my home, walking around the block on a Sunday evening, August of 2018. And I tried to get our legislative services to write a bill that would accomplish what I wanted to do. I reached out to a number of different groups and I happened to reach out to my friend, Matt, at uh, Alliance Defending Freedom well into the process. This was, um, you know, uh, anyway, it, well into the process. And that's when uh, they were able to help me, but I was the one that reached out to them as we could not get the bill written as it needed to be written in our own Idaho legislative services. Thank you for that. And Representative Ehart, thank you so much for authoring this bill for getting it through the process, for dealing with everything that you had to deal with throughout the process. Feminists are very familiar with dealing with the kinds of experiences that you had to deal with in terms of needing police escorts and the threats and the violence. And we're very grateful for your leadership. Inga Thompson, thank you so much for your founding of the foundation. We're all very grateful for your fight to protect women and girls sports. Keely, thank you for speaking on behalf of radical feminists from the perspective of an Idaho resident who, if I'm not wrong, uh, supported Representative Ehart in her efforts to get the bill through and contacted your Republican governor to encourage him to sign the bill, which he did. And Jennifer Chavez, thank you so much for breaking down the ACLU's lawsuit on this. Uh, we all very much look forward to seeing how things develop and uh, go girl athletes in Connecticut. And with that, I will sign off. Thank you everyone who attended. I hope you have found this to be a productive discussion and we look forward to talking more soon.